Hello, everyone. I'm so excited to be here with you today. My name is Sandy Chung. My pronouns are she and her. I'm honored to be participating today with you in Lobby Days as Executive Director of the ACLU of Oregon. I started this position recently on February 1st of this year. To begin our Lobby Day, I would like to acknowledge that today, many of us are located on the traditional village sites of the Multnomah, Kathlamet, Clackamas, Chinook, Tualatin, Kalapuya, Molala, and other indigenous nations. We pay our respects to our elders, past and present, who have stewarded this land for generations. To introduce myself, I would like to share with you my family story as immigrants from South Korea. My parents came to America because they believed it was a land of opportunity, especially for their three children. In South Korea, my dad, my appa in Korean, was a government bureaucrat, and my mom, my amma, a healthcare worker. In America, though, like many immigrants, my parents work with their hands because they weren't fluent in English. Our first year, my dad worked as a dishwasher and custodian. After a year, my parents purchased Alameda cleaners from another immigrant family, and my parents learned to clean clothing to care for their family. Alameda cleaners was located on Alberta Street in Northeast Portland. In our family business, my dad cleaned clothes, and my mom helped customers and did alterations. My siblings and I helped too. To this day, I believe my sister can go head to head with anyone in an ironing competition, and I'm not too shabby at pressing men's dress shirts. At our cleaners, my parents modeled for us the value of hard work, that any job can be done with dignity and integrity. At Alameda Cleaners, I also learned the value of community. In the 80s, we had neighbors and customers of diverse backgrounds, including many from the black community. At that time, some considered Northeast Portland an undesirable part of town. For my family though, this was our beloved home where our community supported us with their patronage and kindnesses and helped shield us from harms. From my lived experience, I know that each and every person and community has inherent value and dignity and deserve respect and care. The content of our character is what counts, not the color of our skin or where we were born, not our sex, gender, or sexual orientation, not our ability status, and not the size of our bank accounts or what part of town we live. These are my core values and that of the ACLU of Oregon. However, not everyone in our country shares these values. We are a country where systemic racism and classism wreak havoc on black, indigenous, people of color, and low-income communities. These communities must endure the devastation caused by inequities such as mass incarceration, law enforcement violence, pollution, and less access to essential services like good healthcare and good schools. The harms of systemic racism are especially laid bare by COVID-19. During the continuing pandemic, more than 500,000 people have died in the US and nationwide, black and indigenous people died at 1.4 times the rate of white people and Latinx people died at 1.2 times the rate. In recent years, we've also witnessed intentional acts of racism by our government. In 2017, with actions like the Muslim ban, the federal government started blocking predominantly non-white people from entering the US. And then the government accelerated the arrest and deportation of non-white immigrants. It was especially brutal and inhumane when our government started separating refugee children from their families and placing children, predominantly brown children, in chain link cages. Intentional and evil actions of racism by our government, this is not new. We are a nation built on genocide and family separation against indigenous people and the slavery of black people. We are a nation built on excluding non-white people, starting with Chinese and other Asian people from immigration and citizenship. We are a nation that caged Japanese American families in internment camps. Racism runs deep throughout our nation's history. So when we see intentional and systemic actions of racism today, it is not an aberration. It is by design. To all of the ACLU of Oregon community here today, we have so much work to do to make sure that the arc of history bends towards justice. Here, I would like to share with you our values-based priorities at the ACLU of Oregon. First, we acknowledge that America was founded on white male supremacy and that the priorities and privileges of white male supremacy run throughout our country's systems and practices. 
we are committed to examining how we have participated in these harmful ways and to oppose and stop them. We are committed to protecting democracy and full democratic participation. We will fight for all people, including incarcerated individuals to have the resources and access they need to exercise the right to vote. We are committed to protecting democracy and our First Amendment right to protest and free speech. Throughout history, government officials have tried to deny First Amendment rights to those who disagreed with government positions, oftentimes targeting BIPOC communities. This is wrong, and we will continue to fight hard for a constitutional right to protest and speech. We are committed to following and supporting the leadership of our Black communities in the Black Lives Matter movement. The systemic racism and violence wielded by law enforcement against black and brown bodies. The mass incarceration of black and brown bodies. This is not acceptable. We will fight with you to end these systems of racism and violence. And we are also committed to social and economic justice for all. And we will focus our efforts on fighting for our most marginalized communities. We will do the work of justice with recognition that Black, Indigenous, and people of color communities have had to endure disproportionate harms for too long, and also with recognition of the wisdom, leadership, and perseverance of our BIPOC communities who have been and will continue to be fundamental to American democracy. For the current 2021 Oregon State Legislative Session, we have translated the ACLU of Oregon's values into the following legislative priority areas, housing and houselessness, strengthening democracy, health and wellness, education equity and justice, consumer privacy and cybersecurity, criminal and restorative justice, public and community safety and economic justice. The 2021 Oregon State Legislative Session is nearing its end and some of the legislative bills that the ACLU of Oregon had championed with our allies and coalition partners did not make it this far. However, there is still a range of legislation before our legislature that we strongly support. You should have received access to a two-page document with a list of these currently pending bills. The legislation that is still viable in our state ranges from a bill that strengthens democracy by restoring voting rights for Oregonians in prison, and a bill that centers the healthcare needs of Oregonians when healthcare systems are bought or merged. Several bills are pending right now as well that will create greater racial and criminal justice through a wide range of mechanisms, including restorative justice approaches, funding of drug treatment and recovery, and spending, instead of continued criminalization of drug offenses, and a bill that will remove barriers to Oregonians from getting criminal convictions expunged from their records. This expungement will allow formerly incarcerated Oregonians to get housing, go to school, and obtain good work. As well, there are bills that will support the safety and wellness of Oregon's communities by supporting immigrants and refugees and creating safeguards against unjust federal immigration enforcement efforts. Regarding our ACLU of Oregon priorities before the current legislature, I wanna share a final thought with you. The ACLU of Oregon's values and legislative priorities, which I have described, will not be easy to achieve and they will not be fully achieved during any one state legislative session alone. With work to recognize and fix legal, social, and economic injustice. Sometimes there are people, including people I know and care about, who turn away from this work of justice. Sometimes we turn away because it just breaks us to see the magnitude of pain and grief caused by injustice. Sometimes we also turn away because we don't know what to do. I have faced these questions myself. What can I do and will it be enough? And so I am so grateful to you for being here today for saying by your actions that we can make our world better. We truly couldn't do this work without your support. These lobby days are tremendously important. They help us show legislators that our members are engaged, that they care about our values and the issues that are we, at, we are advocating for on behalf of Oregonians. These legislative days, these lobby days, also help us gather information about legislators' views 
through the information that you report back to us. And for those of you who don't normally engage with elected leaders, we hope this process, these lobby days, will leave you feeling empowered and with you knowing that you can do something and that it will make a difference. Now, I would like to take some time to introduce some folks who are with us today. First, I would like to introduce the ACLU of Oregon staff who are here today. They are Jan Carson, Deputy Director, Kelly Simon, Interim Legal Director, Crystal Vosfeld, Paralegal and the Coordinator of our Legal Intake Volunteer Program, Yvonne Garcia, Development Director, Savannah Weber, Development Associate, Christina Nguyen, Membership Engagement Officer, Doug Brown, Communication Strategist, and Jose Mendez, Operations Fiscal Manager. I want to recognize Yvonne, Savannah, and Christina for taking the lead in developing and coordinating lobby days, with particular thanks to Christina, who has led our lobby day efforts wonderfully and tremendously. Next, I would also like to introduce you to the ACLU of Oregon board members who are here today. They are Marina Barcelo and Mariana Lindsay, the co-presidents of our board of directors, and Jim Arneson, Janine Morales, and Sarah Purse are board members. Janine will be speaking to you tomorrow, and I'm very excited for you to hear Janine. We also have ACLU of Oregon legal observers here today. Legal observers help us with the important work of observing and documenting actions of police at protests and other public assemblies. Thank you to our legal observers for your important work supporting our constitutional rights and our democracy. Also, I wanna recognize legal observer Stacia Brunel, who will be one of the leads during our virtual visits with our legislators. Thank you to our ACLU of Oregon staff, board members and volunteers. Now, before telling you about the wonderful array of virtual events we have planned for you today, I'd like to ground us in group agreements. By participating today, it is our expectation that you will create a space that values and respects differences of race, ethnicity, immigration status, age, gender, sexual orientation, gender identity, religion, ability, and socioeconomic circumstance. We each will respect and contribute to the ACLU's culture of belonging by fostering an equitable and inclusive experience on all aspects of community work by centering Black, Indigenous, and people of color voices and experiences. This will look like listening to understand by making space for and prioritizing oppressed voices, speaking my truth responsibly by taking responsibility for one's impact regardless of one's intent, and for white people and other privileged identities not putting the burden on BIPOC and other oppressed groups educate you about the harms that your actions and behaviors created. And finally, but not last or least, being willing to do things differently and to experience discomfort by seeing discomfort and tension as an opportunity to grow, not a barrier to it. Thank you for your willingness to be here with us today and for your willingness to honor the space with these community agreements. I'd also like to provide some notes related to Zoom. This event is being recorded and will be available on our website later this evening. We know that there are some friends and family and ACLU of Oregon community members who aren't able to be here. So please feel free to share the recording with your friends and family. I'd like to thank our captioner, Lauren Shirley from LNS Captioning and our ASL interpreters, Abel Constantino and Christina Healy. If you prefer to have the interpreter's window large and the rest of the participants' windows much smaller, you can use the pin feature to keep the interpreter's window larger. And if you need any Zoom or tech support today or tomorrow, please email development at aclu-or.org for support. Now I would like to share with you what you can expect during today's lobby day. First, we will hear from our wonderful Congresswoman Suzanne Bonamici. At about 1.20 p.m., Sammy Alloy from the Health Justice Recovery Alliance will provide a lobby one-on-one -on -one training. During this training, you will learn about the most effective ways of engaging with their legislators, including how to engage with them directly today and tomorrow when you meet with them. At about 2 p.m., we have organized an action alert, an email blast. At the start of that portion, 
you'll be provided with more information and instructions about how to engage in this event. At about 2.15 p.m., you will have the opportunity to learn about digital organizing and engagement from a panel of our coalition partners and allies. And then for the final part of today, from about 3 p.m. to 4.30 p.m., you will have the opportunity to have small group meetings of about 15 minutes with legislators. During this time, you will have the opportunity to put your lobby 101 skills into practice and to advocate for bills that advance justice and equity for Oregonians. I know our lobby day today is rich and full and each of you is taking time away from your work, family and friends to be here today. I want to say to you from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for your deep care that you have for your families and communities and for your commitment to working for an Oregon, Oregon that is more fair, just and equitable. We have so much gratitude for your participation today. Now, I would like to share some words to introduce Congresswoman Suzanne Bonamici. Congresswoman Suzanne Bonamici represents the first congressional district of Oregon in the Northwest part of Oregon, which includes Washington, Yamhill, Clatsop, Columbia counties at, and the part of Multnomah County. I'm a resident of Washington County and I'm very thankful to have the Congresswoman as my US House representative. Congresswoman Bonamici was born in Detroit and raised in a small Michigan town. She worked her way through college, first at Lane Community College here in Oregon, and then at the University of Oregon, where she earned her bachelor's and law degree. During college and law school, the Congresswoman worked at Lane County Legal Aid. After law school, the Congresswoman was an attorney at the Federal Trade Commission in Washington, D.C., in the Bureau of Consumer Protection. She then practiced law in Portland. Congresswoman Bonamici has been an Oregon House Representative and Oregon State Senator. So she knows well the types of processes you are engaged in today with state legislators. The Congresswoman became a representative to the US House of Representatives in 2012 as a member of the Committee on Education and Labor. She is dedicated to giving educators and students the resources they need to succeed. Strengthening public education is one of the Congresswoman's top priorities and is one of the reasons she got involved in public service. The Congresswoman is the only House member from the Pacific Northwest on the Select Committee on the Climate Crisis, where she is fighting for comprehensive policies that mitigate the effects of climate change, strengthen the economy, and protect our planet for future generations. The Congresswoman is also a leader on the Committee on Science, Space, and Technology, and is a champion for civil rights as chair of the Subcommittee on Civil Rights and Human Services. She has worked with the ACLU of Oregon on civil rights to prevent abuses by federal agents and immigration and customs enforcement, to protect choice and the bodily autonomy of women and other important issues. In summary, like the ACLU of Oregon, Congresswoman Bonamici cares deeply about Oregonians. Without further ado, I would like to introduce you to Congresswoman Suzanne Bonamici. Sandy, thank you so much. It was a very kind introduction. Uh, can you hear me all right? Yes, I can hear you, Congresswoman. Terrific. Well, well, hello, ACLU members uh, in Oregon. I'm really pleased to join you. And thank you again, Sandy, for that kind introduction. I, I wish we could be in person, uh, but we're here together virtually, as we know, during incredibly challenging times. And we know that too many individuals and families are still struggling and the pandemic has laid bare so many inequities and structural racism that have held back families and individuals for too long. I know we have a long road to recovery ahead and we have to focus on equity as we move forward. Uh, so we're also in the middle, as we know, of a long overdue reckoning with the racist roots and consequences of our criminal justice system. In Oregon and around the country, people from all backgrounds are rightly demanding change. And I know you have some very important messages and importantly stories to share with legislators over the next two days. And I applaud you for participating in the legislative process and for speaking out and working for justice and civil rights. I think one of the one of the few silver linings of the last four years has been really an unprecedented wave of civic engagement. Our democracy is stronger when everyone in the community participates. So thank you for making your voices heard. As you heard in that kind introduction, 
when I worked my way through college and law school, uh, I worked at legal aid and I learned a lot from advocating for families who were just kind of fighting for a, a fair shot. And I'll, I'll never forget the people I worked with at legal aid and I'll continue to carry their stories with me as a policymaker. And one of the things that I learned to appreciate at, at legal aid, and I started there uh, before I started law school uh, and then worked there during part of the time I was in law school as well, is that justice is for all. It's a right, not a privilege. And your advocacy for universal representation for immigrants caught in the system really reflects that truth. Um, when uh, later on in, in life, uh, when my own children were, were young, I began volunteering in our, our public schools and with the Classroom Law Project, helping young people understand our system of government and our branches of government and how to make a difference and sort of witnessing their growth as advocates and as students and the learning process was pretty powerful. So in my work in the state legislature and now in Congress, hearing directly from the people I represent uh, is really there to make a difference. Um, their voices do matter and, and it, it is really critical and they inform my decision. So your conversations with legislators today and tomorrow are really helping to drive the change we need. I understand you'll be discussing immigration and criminal justice issues with state legislators. Addressing the injustices in these systems is going to take all of us working together at the local, state, and federal level, and I'm honored to be your partner on these issues. We know the immigration system has been broken for a long time, and the Trump administration inflicted damage, pain, and heartache uh, for too many families. Now, with the Biden-Harris administration, we're starting to rebuild trust, which is an important part of the process, and starting to make long overdue policy changes that are important to our families, our communities, our economy, and our standing in the world. We have a lot of work to do, including long overdue humane comprehensive immigration reform, as well as seeking specific remedies for dreamers, for children and parents who were forced apart, for asylum seekers wrongly denied entry, for farm workers and migrant workers and others who have been caught up in a broken system. I'm currently leading and began uh, in the last Congress leading legislation to prevent ICE enforcement actions at sensitive locations like courthouses, healthcare facilities, places of worship. The, this legislation was inspired in part by the Oregon story about Isidro, a US citizen who was wrongfully profiled outside the Washington County Courthouse. And thank you to the ACLU for your work on behalf of Isidro and for working to strengthen our state sanctuary law, which as we know passed our state legislature back uh, in the 80s. So on Tuesday, we received welcome news that the Biden administration will reinstate guidance limiting immigration enforcement at courthouses. And that's what it was before, guidance. Our efforts to strengthen these guidelines by codifying them will continue. We will not stop our efforts to get these into law. Guidance can be reversed laws, it's a lot harder. So addressing the inequities of our criminal justice, justice system is another effort that is going to take all of us working together. And last year I joined with students in Beaverton, Sandy at Sunset High School was one of the places where we got together and we were marching for justice and Black Lives Matter. I voted for the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act earlier this year. The bill is going to increase accountability and oversight of federal, state, and local law enforcement. We know that legislation cannot and will not bring back George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, or the countless others who have been killed or mistreated by the very individuals who were sworn by oath to protect them. But we can honor their memory by working to prevent these abuses going forward. Helping Oregonians clear their records and move forward with their lives after conviction is another critical part of unraveling the damage that's been done by our criminal justice system. Our challenge locally and nationally is to work together to overcome these obstacles to progress and historical injustices. And we have an opportunity now to really work towards solutions. And I hope that brings new energy to your efforts. I will continue to work with you to advocate for a better, equitable, and more inclusive future. If the pandemic has taught us anything, it's that we are truly stronger together. So thank you. I hope your conversations with legislators are productive and meaningful. 
And next, I'm going to turn it over to Sammy Alloy uh, from the Health Justice Recovery Alliance, who's going to be leading the Lobbying 101 training. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Ah, there we go. Just took a second to be able to start my video. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me and thank you so much for being with us today and taking time out of your busy schedules to be with the Oregon ACLU to advocate around these critical issues of expanding access to democracy, health, criminal justice reform, community safety, and other issues. Um, my name is Sammy Alloy. I am the Coalition Director of Oregon's Health Justice Recovery Alliance, a statewide coalition of about 70 organizations, including the Oregon ACLU, working for the equitable and strong implementation of Oregon's new Drug Addiction Treatment and Recovery Act, which voters passed in November as Measure 110. I've been working on uh, social, economic, um, and racial justice issues uh, with the Oregon legislature for about a decade. And I wanna share with you today a little bit of an overview of what citizen lobbying is, how it works, and how it fits into the bigger picture of how a bill becomes a law. So let's jump in. So the players in Oregon, our uh, state legislature has two chambers, the House of Representatives and the Senate that pass bills uh, to the governor's desk uh, where she may sign them into law. Um, and in Oregon, we have uh, our state legislature meets annually in the state capitol in Salem. And we have a long session on the odd numbered years and a short session during the month of February in the even numbered years. So right now we're right in the middle of the long session where most of the work happens. Um, it begins around the beginning of February and it goes till around the 4th of July. Um, Doug, can you advance my slide? There we go. Um, so if you're old enough to remember Schoolhouse Rock, you may know the song about how a bill becomes a law. And I just want to take a quick uh, second to do a little overview of the steps for you. So, uh, you know, ideas are generated by concerned citizens, advocacy groups, or legislative champions. Uh, and those ideas are drafted into legislation by the legislators, the legislature's lawyers, legislative council. Um, those ideas are introduced and they are assigned by the Senate president or the House Speaker of the House to a policy committee uh, where the committee uh, holds public hearings on the bill, they workshop it and they may pass it out of committee pass it with amendments or not pass it and the bill is dead. Uh, so right now we're at the stage where most of the first committee deadlines have passed. So the bills are sort of moving on to the next phase of the process. Uh, they may be referred to the Joint Committee on Ways and Means, which controls the legislature's purse strings and they, may, they might have uh, funding or a cost assessment attached. And then they go to a chamber floor, the House or Senate, where they might get voted out of the chamber, go to the second chamber and repeat the process over again. Uh, and if they pass out of the legislature, they go to the governor's desk to get signed into law. So where do we fit in as constituent lobbyists? You know, your voice is so important at every stage of the process. A lot of organizations and corporations have paid professional lobbyists that uh, advocate to uh, lawmakers around um, law bills that uh, have their clients' interests at heart. But ultimately, lawmakers are elected by us. They answer to us. Uh, and they need to hear from us. So it's so important uh, that you're here today to uh, advocate directly to them like we're gonna do later today and tomorrow. So what does that look like? How can we influence our decision makers? 
these are sort of listed um, in order of their impactfulness. So we can send mass postcards and emails, which is you know, such an important way to show interest and volume to lawmakers, but even more impactful than that is sending a handwritten or a personalized letter. We can call the lawmaker's office. We can enlist help by getting grass tops or influential community leaders to contact all lawmakers together with us. We can work together in coalition with other organizations like Health Justice Recovery Alliance works with Oregon ACLU. We can get our message published in the media, either through submitting letters to the editor, op-eds, or working with a reporter on a story. Um, and we can meet in person, or in this case, virtually with legislators and their staff, uh, which is a, a very important and impactful way to influence them. So thank you so much for your commitment to do that today. Um, what does a successful lobby visit look like? And I'll go through these points individually since I know it's a lot of information. Um, first of all, it's important to establish in advance what the goal or the ask of the meeting will be. Um, and to be prepared for the meeting by knowing uh, you know, what our roles are going to be and what messages we want to convey. So I know that Oregon ACLU has um, a, invited uh, community members to serve as lobby leads today that are gonna be helping, uh, helping you navigate these meetings and they've sent talking points to you in advance. So you should have those in your inbox and familiarize yourself with those before these meetings. Um, introduce yourselves, stay focused and take notes during the meeting. And in particular note, any questions or comments that the legislator has so that members of the coalition can follow up and get those questions answered for them after the fact. What do we mean when we say establishing a goal or an ask? It's, uh, this is the purpose of the meeting and what action we want that lawmaker to take on our behalf. Um, so this often means asking your legislature for a specific commitment. Will they support or will they oppose a specific bill, such as, for example, SB 1053? If your lawmaker has already committed to support the bill, you may want to consider asking them to take more proactive action, such as co-sponsoring a bill or working behind the scenes to influence their colleagues. You may, um, if, you're in, if you're meeting with them on a particular topic, you might ask that the legislator consider introducing legislation on that topic for a future session. But I always um, end a meeting by uh, making sure to ask a specific question. Always have that ask, for example, can I count on you to support SB 1070? Um, be prepared. Uh, meet up with your lobby groups and your lobby leads 15 minutes before your scheduled meeting time. It's so important not to skip that prep time because it is uh, key to having a successful conversation. Um, read through all the materials that you've been given and know what messages you want to convey. Decide who uh, is going to introduce the group and what roles each person is going to have. Who's going to start the conversation and who's gonna make each point. And critically, who's going to make that specific ask to hold that legislator to their commitment? Uh, remember, you're not expected to be an absolute expert on every uh, piece of legislation or issue, um, but you are expected to be prepared and to know what points that you want to make to the legislator. Um, in your meeting, um, please be prompt. Don't skip the prep meeting and know that uh, if you're late, you may miss your spot on the calendar because these meetings are only 15 minutes long. Uh, introduce yourself. You should keep your introduction short, sweet, and to the point, but please say your name. Mention any ties to the legislator, like if you're a constituent, that's important for them to know, and what organization you're there representing. Uh, keep your points clear, concise, relevant, and compelling. Remember, we only have uh, 15 minutes, so make sure you know which messages you want to convey to the legislator. 
and uh, explain your particular interest or if you have a personal story related to the issue, that's always more compelling uh, to connect around emotions and values than just rattling off facts and figures. If you don't know the answer to a question, that's perfectly okay, but please don't make anything up. And uh, be clear in that ask. Um, and if they uh, aren't willing to make a firm commitment, which is very common that legislators and staff might not be prepared uh, to say their commitment in the meeting, but you can ask uh, when you can expect an answer and who in their office you should contact if you don't hear back. Um, that's why it's so important to take notes uh, so that we know if a legislator has a question that we can follow up and make sure that they get the correct answer to that question. And remember, always be courteous and say thank you to the legislator for taking the time to meet with you. And it's so appreciated to send a thank you note after a lobby visit. And I know that the ACLU is sending you postcards that you can use for that purpose. Other tips, be honest and diplomatic. Uh, if you don't know the answer, it's okay to admit it. Be flexible. There are a lot of last minute time constraints uh, in a legislative session. So if the time of your meeting changes or you meet with staff instead of the lawmaker themselves, that's still very effective. Uh, and it's sort of important to be able to roll with the punches. Uh, you're representing nonprofit organizations, so it's important not to uh, talk about supporting or opposing specific candidates or parties for public office in these meetings. Uh, don't choose gu chew gum, et cetera. You know, use basic etiquette, um, mute yourself when you're not speaking. And uh, no one person or organization should dominate the conversation. And remember, always thank the legislator and be courteous to them for taking the time. This session is particularly challenging because we're doing it virtually. It's our first virtual session as advocates. It's also the lawmakers first virtual session. So it's really challenging for everyone. And it's important to have a little bit of grace uh, around how confusing this can be for all of us, right? Um, but there are some important tools that we can use to follow along with a virtual session. Um, you should uh, register in advance if you're providing testimony for a committee hearing. Uh, and there are uh, specific ways to do that that you can use through the Oregon Legislative Information System. I won't go too uh, into detail about OLIS, the Oregon Legislative Information System, but it's a great tool. And the Oregon ACLU is here to support you in learning to navigate that resource if you want more information about it. Some of the things that you can do on OLIS is to search uh, for bills using keywords, um, you know, from the issue that you're looking for. You can search for a bill using their bill number, and you can find information about the bill, such as how different legislators voted. You can look at people's testimony, and you can register to uh, get alerts to follow along on a bill's um, progress through the process. So it's really helpful. Um, Again, pro tips, you can, you can sign up to receive bill and committee alerts, um, and you can contact your legislator through OLIS if you want to uh, call, email, or write your legislator, or you want to schedule a follow-up visit, you can do that by emailing their staff. So before I let you go, I want to talk a little bit about my organization uh, and the issue that we're working on, which is one of the issues that you're going to be talking about in your lobby visits, which is funding and implementing the Drug Addiction Treatment and Recovery Act, uh, which is going through the legislature as Senate Bill 755, um, not 775, that's a typo. Um, so also um, because of that typo, it's not uh, Senator Chuck Thompson, it's uh, Senator Floyd Pazanski. But the, these talking points are the right ones. So you can take a look at those. 
So, um, you know, why do we have to pass a bill if we already passed a ballot measure is a question that we often get. It's confusing and it um, it's a little frustrating because voters overwhelmingly passed measure 110 by a 17 point margin in November. Um, and so uh, it's it can be a little confusing that we have to do this legislative advocacy, but it's so important that legislators um, weigh in on ballot measures and do rulemaking and allocate funding to get those ballot measures implemented. And this is a normal part of the process. And Senate Bill 755 uh, has language that just mirrors the uh, measure that was passed by voters in November and makes some minor changes in amendments, mostly to um, to things like adding added detail where the measure is silent, it might clear up confusing language or make basic uh, stylistic changes to the measure. Uh, and it also is a stand in for allocating that funding that that voters voted on. And it's so important that we continue our advocacy um, to lawmakers uh, on this issue because you know, heartbreaking data from the Oregon Health Authority shows that the COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated Oregon's already stark addiction crisis. Uh, drug overdoses in Oregon increased 40% between January and June of 2020 compared to the same period in 2019. And Oregon uh, has historically been near last in the nation in terms of access to treatment and recovery services for those who want them. And for too long, we've responded to drugs uh, with arrests and prison and jail beds, predominantly and disproportionately impacting Black, Indigenous, and Latinx communities. By providing increased access to culturally responsive, trauma-informed, and patient-centered addiction and recovery services is one way that we can begin to heal these harms that span generations. And one of the ways that lawmakers can support Oregon's new law is by supporting SB 755 when it comes through their committee for consideration. Right now, uh, the bill is in ways and means uh, awaiting funding. Um, and it's so critical that the Oregon legislature continue to work to fully impl implement this measure as the Drug Addiction Treatment and Recovery Act. And thank you so much for your work today to help make that possible. Um, thank you so much for listening and following along. I hope this was helpful for you. And um, we wanna give you a little break and a breather before we move on to the next part of the program. So I'm gonna move us into a 10 minute break. Thank you so much, everyone.
Hey, hello everybody. Thanks for joining us. My name is Doug Brown. I'm the communications strategist at the ACLU of Oregon. My, pronoun, my pronouns are he and him. Um, I'm gonna get started with the panel shortly, but before we do that, I was hoping people um, could take, click the link in the chat and just fill out our action alert to promote the Sanctuary Promise Act. What this does is contact your legislature, both your representative and senator, urging them to support this uh, strengthening of our sanctuary law. Uh, I'm sure a number of you watching here um, helped fight against Measure 105 a few years back, and we really need to keep the momentum going and, um, and strengthen this law. Um, Jake, are you around? Um, if so, I invite Jake to turn your camera. There you are, perfect. I Jake, I'm, I'm wondering if you could introduce yourself, um, your organization, and essentially why people should fight for this for this law. Of course, yeah. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm excited to uh, be alongside you all today. Um, my name is Jake. I use he/him pronouns. I'm an organizer with Together Lab, uh, Levin Community Land and Housing Coalition, and the Interfaith Movement for Immigrant Justice, which is a lot of words to say that I am an organizer for uh, racial immigrant housing and climate justice in Washington County. Um, and like you said, Doug, I think you just pointed out, you know, Oregon has a long history of sanctuary and that this is just a continuation of that. Here at Emerge, we've been involved, especially recently in this, um, going back to 2018 with our ICE out of NORCOR campaign um, following up with a campaign to release asylum seekers and shared in detention centers. As you mentioned, the defeat of Measure 105, which also happened that year, um, which would have repealed the limitations of local law enforcement and cooperating with ICE. And then going into 2019, uh, fighting to prevent ICE arrests at the courthouses. And so this is something that we've been working on for a long time. And it's important to acknowledge while Oregon's history with this is strong and we have one of the longest standing sanctuaries in the country that we are still hearing stories coming into 2020 and 2021 of people being detained by ICE after interacting with law enforcement. So clearly there are still loopholes and ways in which our communities aren't safe. And so the beautiful thing about this bill is that it makes crystal clear the laws um, that we want to put into place. And it does so in five ways. The first is disentanglement. So this builds trust in Oregon's communities by clearly and explicitly prohibiting local law enforcement and governments from working with and communicating with federal agents for Im uh, immigration enforcement. The second way is not only this, but private right of action. So if these laws aren't enforced, this allows community members to seek accountability when the law is violated. Third is the prohibit, uh, prohibition of detention contracts. So this prohibits state and local correctional facilities from contracting with federal government uh, for immigration detention. But then it goes one step further, which leads me to the fourth point, which it prohibits private detention centers, period. So it prohibits private entities like for-profit cooperation um, from operating private prisons. And finally, going back to our work in 2018 and 2019, uh, it has to do with courthouses. It protects Oregon's justice system by enshrining into law the current state court rule that's already in place that prohibits warrantless civil arrests in and around courthouses. Um, and so, like I said before, it's these are all things that are in some way involved in Oregon legislation already, but makes crystal clear and explicit <laughs> so that we can no longer find those loopholes um, and make our communities safe for everyone. Perfect. Yeah. The, so the link is in the chat now, and it's this is one of the most efficient ways to use your time to lobby for good legislation. Um, the form you fill out your information and it directs the 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 email to the correct legislator, both your senator and representative. It's it's um, if you're a good multitasker, do that now. Um, happy to do it. Happy to do it. Free to do it afterwards. Um, the link again is in the chat, and it's on our website and in emails. Um, and then now that we have that, I'm hoping the other panelists can turn their cameras on. Jake will be joining us for this, uh, for this next part. Perfect there, what a crowd. Um, great, so yeah, for those of you who didn't hear me the first time, my name is Doug Brown. I'm a communications strategist at the ACLU of Oregon. 
Um, I'm excited to introduce you to these folks. We got Kenny Adams, uh, an activist and community liaison. We got Jake, who we, you just heard from, um, Maria Cahill from the Pacific Northwest Family Circle, uh, Luke Richter from or Central Oregon Peacekeepers. Um, and I know, so just, just some um, logistical meetings or logistical information. I know a number of you have, a number of you watching have legislator meetings that start during this scheduled panel. Uh, but don't worry, there will be recording you can watch afterward. Um, so don't don't worry about that. I know you want to, you, everybody's tuning in to watch me. So um, don't stress out about that. Um, so yeah, it, again, if you want, if there's something you want to ask, there's a Q and A box, there's a chat. Um, we'll, I'll be monitoring that while we have this uh, conversation with these uh, important people doing um, seeking seeking justice in in many different ways throughout the state. Um, I first want to start with with Maria. Um, I'm wondering if you could, Maria, if you could introduce yourself and introduce what your organization does. Absolutely, Doug. Thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Maria Cahill. My pronouns are they, them, or any pronouns. And, and I'm a spokesperson, administrator, organizer for Pacific Northwest Family Circle, which is a group of families whose loved ones were killed by police who struggle for justice together for police accountability. And our mission is to um, educate the public about what public safety could really look like. And um, because Clearly, our family's loved ones were not safe, and um, and to change laws and policies around policing in Oregon and Washington. Perfect. I'm wondering if you could. What are the What are all the different ways you work to achieve this mission? I know, like district attorney accountability, um, protest rights. I'm wondering how, what are the different ways, and how can people get involved to support your mission? Yeah. So we, uh, you mentioned two great. Two, two great ones. Um, in Oregon DA for the People is an organization that Pacific Northwest Family Circle uh, co-founded with Showing Up for Racial Justice Portland. Um, and this is an effort to educate the public about the power of the district attorney and their ability to hold police accountable and, and to do a lot of other things that are within the six pillars of the Oregon DA for the People platform. So if you wanna support families in their justice struggle, you can, you, and, and um, upholding democracy and the, um, the power of local elections is something that really um, inspires you, then uh, one way you could support families is by getting involved with the Oregon DA for the People. But if you wanted to work directly with uh, families, and um, or or just directly in support of families. There are all sorts of ways to get involved. We just became a, a, an officially a nonprofit. We've been operating since 2016 as a as a community group, and so um, we are really looking to ramp things up in terms of our ability to have impact in the state. Um, and we need a communications and social media person. We need people to help us with grant writing and fundraising, um, helping with day of events. One of the things that we do, one of the ways that we work is through angel bursaries. So we hold an event on the day that a loved one was killed by police and, um, and invite the public to come meet family members and learn more about this person and celebrate their lives. And, um, and usually, show some, there's usually some form of displeasure showing, um, which can take the place of a, of a public um, protest or a public grieving session. Um, and honestly, the two are very similar. So almost everything we do, we have red heart balloons that we um, put out for our events and with the names of loved ones on it. And we chalk the names of loved ones killed throughout Oregon at our events on the sidewalk. So we're always looking for help with a day of events on angelversaries. We have an angelversary coming up for TT Gully on May 29th, which is gonna be a real big one. And um, uh, we have, we also, so we hold those angelversaries in, um, in online since COVID. Um, and so, uh, that that's been um, that's another way that you could participate is by joining us for those. And one of the 
Um, Angelversary is coming up. It, um, thank you for putting that in the chat. Is the Keat Notice vigil 11 years ago? Loved one Keat Notice was killed by Portland police, the equivalent of the gun violence reduction team that's just been inst reinstated by um, Portland Mayor and Police Commissioner Ted Wheeler. Um, and so we will be holding a, um, an online anniversary for Keaton Otis. And then we, there's a monthly vigil for Keaton Otis every 12th of the month, which the community has never missed. Um, other ways that you could get involved is helping us with justice artwork and making flyers. There's just all sorts of work to do. The families have a lot of ideas. Great, yeah, and for all of you watching who want to get connected with Maria and the Pacific Northwest Family Circle, Information is in the chat um, and we'll make sure that's available to you all. Um, thank you, Maria. I wanna to throw to Kenny next. Kenny, I'm wondering if you could introduce yourself, where you're from, and I'm particularly interested in your um, in how you got into the social work, uh, social justice work you're doing now. Uh, my name's Kenny Adams, uh, pronouns are he, him, and uh, I've lived in Central Oregon since about 2000, end of 2013. And I really was not involved in any uh, dedicated uh, social justice work until uh, right, right around June 7th of last year, uh, when there was a march against racism that happened here in Bend, Oregon. And that was roughly right around what activated me. Um, and what that, I didn't really even know what that looked like um, until I'd say fairly recently um, when, uh, I, I started writing. Um, I, I've always done a, uh, a large amount of writing, but typically it was more so geared at pop culture, things like that. But uh, there was a lot that really hit me to my core with um, the murder of George Floyd and uh, everything that subsequently happened after that. It just kind of just stirred up in me and started writing. Writing turned into speaking. Uh, speaking turned into uh, advocacy and community organization. Um, I do a lot of work with trying to uh, join the uh, communities that are oftentimes called marginalized communities. But my, my biggest goal is to break out of that mindset because if we keep labeling ourselves marginalized, then we're constantly going to be marginalized. So it's time to break out of those barriers, break into those margins and really make a difference. Thank you, Kenny. I'm gonna come back to you shortly. Um, mm -hmm. Next, I wanna throw it to Luke, Luke Richter. Um, for those of you who don't know, we, ACLU of Oregon, um, we recently came to the defense of the Central Oregon Peacekeepers in a public records um, lawsuit that the city of Bend is suing Luke and, and his group. and. Uh, first became aware of the Central Oregon Peacekeepers in August after they organized a big protest on a, uh, during an ICE action in Bend. Um, Luke, I'm wondering if you could talk about the founding of your, of your group um, and also essentially how you organized people around that day. And if you could just explain more of that, that event, that'd be great. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, like you said, my name is Luke Richter. I'm the president of the Central Oregon Peacekeepers. Uh, my pronouns are he, him. Uh, really, the Central Oregon Peacekeepers came about uh, based off of kind of like Kenny, just seeing uh, the response to George Floyd uh, dying and just watching all of those videos and then going to one of the first protests that happened in Bend uh, regarding that issue. Uh, there was a beautiful event. There were at least a thousand people there. And it, it felt like, it almost felt like there were just as many counter protesters uh, they weren't necessarily just kind of standing across the street yelling at us, but they just kept driving by us, rolling coal at us, uh, just yelling profanities, racial slurs, uh, homophobic slurs, anything they could do to try and rile us up. They just kept yelling at people. So uh, I decided that that's not that's clearly not safe, uh, especially when you look at what's happened around the country regarding some of these actions. There's been a lot of people that get injured during those uh, events, unfortunately. And uh, we took it upon ourselves to basically set up so we can uh, basically be the wall between uh, whatever marginalized community is out there standing for themselves and the people that don't agree with them standing up for themselves for some reason. Uh, so since then, that's what we've been doing. And uh, like Doug said, the biggest event that kind of came about because of something like that is 
uh, when ICE decided to come to Bend, uh, they brought two buses with them and we basically just stood in front of them and said they weren't gonna leave until something happened to show that what was happening was legal. Uh, really the main way that we got as many people down there as we did, which I, I think it totaled almost to a thousand, uh, at least a couple hundred, uh, was really just the power of social media. Uh, when it comes down to a lot of what the peacekeepers do, especially when it comes to uh, the police, uh, we like to uh, live stream it because there's got to be some accountability there. And we know that the police aren't always going to be held accountable despite the fact that they have body cam, uh, body cameras, uh, which Bend at, at that point, I don't think Bend PD or any of the agencies here besides uh, Prineville and I think the county sheriffs had body cameras. Uh, so I just started filming the second I got down there, just told people exactly where I was and to get down there as quickly as possible because I felt like we would all just end up getting arrested because there was maybe 10 to 20 of us there at the moment. And the community responded and now here we are some months later, uh, just doing whatever we can for any community that needs help. Yeah, thank you, Luke. I've been uh, very impressed with the amount of work that you all have been putting in. Um, I went down there, I went down to Bend to meet with the peacekeepers a few weeks back and they put in a lot of work. Uh, next, I want to go back to, to Jake. Um, this is an issue I've been thinking a lot about recently is, um, you know, a lot of people became became activated to be like and, and became activists after Trump was elected in 2016. Um, and it was a long, hard four years. And I'm wondering how, how we may maintain the momentum, especially in terms of immigrants' rights and why we need to maintain the momentum regardless of who is president. Um, and how do, you, how do you keep people energized to keep going? Yeah, thank you, Doug. That's an excellent question. Um, as you named with the Trump administration, you know, there's this huge sense of urgency that was fueled by self-preservation and, and was very reactionary. And I just want to name that this was incredibly necessary at the time as our communities were being greatly impacted and um, a lot of the injustices were being made hyper visible <laughs> in many ways. And so as we move forward with new elected officials in office, I hope that people remember that a lot of these systemic structures that are in place that affect people don't change with the change of elected officials. And I hope that now we seize this opportunity uh, to regain a sense of passion and vision rallied behind change and a sense of possibility and what couldn't be done in the last four years. And really, how do we do that as well while building in places of healing and transform transformation and um, discerning, recognizing that the urgency is always going to be there, um, but that that didn't feel very good over the last four years. And so now we have an opportunity to really uh, push forward and not just not fall behind. And so I hope we seize this to make our community stronger. Um, and as I stated before, just really building in those healing spaces, because in order to go far, we need to slow down and really be there for each other. And I think so many times this work is about righting the wrongs and, and that's true, that will always be there. Um, but now we have an opportunity to, to take a breath together and to push forward together, so. Yeah, and at this point, I wanna encourage all the panelists to be able to chime in, free phone conversation and uh, I'll, I'll keep us going. I wanna, uh, Kenny. Yeah, if I can actually piggyback on what Jake just said about mm -hmm. the togetherness. Um, you kept using that word together and, you know, just joining together. One of the things that I have made it my mission, especially over the last, I'd say, five to seven months is we're constantly, you know, I spoke earlier about the whole uh, marginalized communities and how, you know, that is a key word that gets used often. And oftentimes you hear uh, people that will bring those micro and macro aggressions uh, at the communities of color and the LGBTQ uh, communities as well, saying that, oh, well, you know, that, you know, we're the majority. You keep hearing that phrase, we're the silent majority, which according to this last election, not so much, but you keep hearing those phrases said all uh, over and over again. Well, if we would all as these individual communities actually link our arms together and build this, uh, this matrix of diversity and equity because we these are all of our common goals that we're that we've been constantly striving for we link all of our arms together and we have that communication and we table any nonsense that uh, you know that 
can sometimes spark up whenever there's intermingling of groups. And we really do our best to work together to actually achieve those common goals. We will find that we have been the majority all along and that we really can make massive amount of change uh, from a, down to the local government all the way up to the national and federal level. And we're, I believe we're starting to see that and I believe that the world is ripe for that right now. They, they are recognizing that, okay, yeah, you know what? We have a lot to bring to the table. It's no longer something that is uh, there to just say, okay, it's great for you to have this idea, but we're just gonna keep on doing our own thing. We're done doing our own thing, you know, or, or letting, the, letting, the, the, uh, letting the status quo continue. We're there to break that down. I used to say that it was our effort to uh, set the standard, but I think we need to reconstruct the standard. You know, the, the, the standard isn't really, has never really worked for all of these communities. It's time to actually break it down at the foundation, just dig it completely up, chuck that out the window and reconstruct it from the ground up. And we're going to find that we can build something so amazing in this country and really, and then actually create the standard on a global scale. Maria. Yeah, oh, so, so much of what Jake and Kenny just said resonate so strongly for me. Um, I want to I want to talk about a couple of things. I mean, I think the urgency around police accountability, you know, for Pacific Northwest Family Circle, it doesn't matter who is in. It doesn't matter as much who is in power in, in, as far as political parties. Uh, police violence and the murder of community members has gone on through every administration, and every administration has failed to stem the tide of government, you know, our government killing its own people. And we, we so, so we recognize that um, politics, you know, being, being uh, political in, the ter in terms of political parties is not necessarily helpful for our cause. And so, you know, that kind of um, brings me to the point of the togetherness of our organization. Um, we're a multiracial organization, families of all races and backgrounds um, from Oregon and Washington or whose loved ones were killed in Oregon and Washington are welcome to join our group and in fact, to come in and lead our group. The only members of Pacific Northwest Family Circle are people who've lost loved ones to police violence, which is not me. I'm not a member of the organization as much work as I put into it. Um, I'm a supporter, and so we welcome supporters as well. And one of the, to, to, uh, to just highlight, um, you know, Kenny's idea of tabling things that divide us, um, we've done a very controversial thing, I think, but it's been incredibly successful. We have actually tabled the topic of racism and white supremacy in our organization, and this is, this is a message that has come from our BIPOC leaders and from people of all races in the organization um, to say, we want an organization that supports families in their leadership, that, um, that makes their dreams for justice come true without uh, around police accountability, right? We, want, we have a very narrow focus of police accountability. And this is actually what allows our organization to make space for Trump supporters. Um, we actually have, you know, um, we found out in the last four years that some family members are Trump supporters, um, but we don't have conflicts in our organization because we keep the focus very narrow and, and, um, and we work uh, by consensus. So we do have conflicts, but if we have conflicts, we just keep talking them out in the context of our mission, police accountability. And I think that's been incredibly successful. Those, those two frameworks of, of understanding that there's no one politician or political party that's going to help us and, and that we, we, have to, we have to table the things that divide us. And I will say, I'd like to take this moment and just say, um, you know, one of the reasons that I think it's important to make space, um, we, we work with a racial lens. Our BIPOC leadership and, and I work with a racial lens but um, it's important for non-Black families to, to not have to go through, especially white families, 
to not have to go through the process of addressing their own internalized biases and racism while they're going through the incredibly devastating experience of, of police, police murder of their loved ones. Um, and so we kind of just like, we take people as they are and work with them as best we can. Thank you. Um, I want to go to go to Luke. Um, Luke, so you um, you've been you and your your organization have been putting in so much work over the past year. Like you're out there constantly. I'm wondering if you can explain all the various things you might do from week to week, from public records to homelessness outreach, and um, you know, and then I'm wondering like how do you maintain the, how do you maintain the work you're doing to build like long term uh, impact in Ben. Yeah. Oh boy, that's a tough question. Just let me let me think about this week. So, uh, a couple times a week, we uh, take basically food, showers, uh, garbage truck, and uh, clothes, tables, whatever is needed to uh, house those camps around Bend, uh, and with uh, with some other organizations, and just ensure that our houseless neighbors get some of the basic necessities that they won't be able to get just being out there on their own. And uh, here in Central Oregon, that's a very, that's probably, I would say, BIPOC and houseless people are probably some of the most widely kind of disparaged people in the area, just as far as how people react to them if you go through uh, like the local media's Facebook comments after something is brought up regarding uh, either my name or another BIPOC leader's name or uh, something happening at a houseless camp. It's just full of just vile and disgusting uh, vitriol. So uh, part of my week includes, go, uh, like today, I went out and fed probably like 20 pounds of ham to a bunch of people, potato salad, and just, just talk with people because that's what it comes down to. If you humanize the houseless people, they're, they're humans also. They have a story to tell and they're more than happy to just stand there and talk with you if you're not going to be rude to them. Uh, Another thing I also ended up doing this morning was there was a, a group of people that are against vaccinations uh, that were standing outside of a high school this morning. Uh, so part of my days are going to find wherever those guys are at, uh, just so the community is aware of who they are, because a lot of those people are either friends or closely tied to the Bundy family. And if you're not familiar with the Bundy family, uh, they're the group that took over the Malheur uh, federal building a couple years back. Uh, what else? Uh, I don't, the emails are endless, as far as I can say. A meeting with officials, uh, that's always whenever they have time. I have no problem going and knocking on their front door so I can talk about something if it's a pressing issue. Uh, I have done that in the past and I will continue doing that as it does seem to be effective. Uh, what else? Uh, records. Uh, at, at the moment, we're kind of paused on records requests because the city has decided that they felt the need to sue us over a set, but that's just going to keep rolling as soon as we uh, hammer out that legal argument. Uh, there's just there's just always something to do when it comes to the marginalized community. Uh, there's always some some deficiency that's happening, whether it's system created or it's just unavailable uh, where we are. So that's what I I try to do, and uh, the way to just keep that just keep that ball rolling is I trust the people that I surround myself with. I'm not always the one that. I'm the one that ends up making the final choices on what ends up going through our, our team and goes through the Central Oregon Peacekeepers. Uh, but a lot of the people that I work with have the uh, chance to do what they feel is necessary and uh, lead their own teams, essentially. So there are some instances where I'm not fully aware of who's on a specific team, uh, but that's okay, because as long as they're not spreading our information, which they haven't been, then I see no issue with allowing just as many people as possible to jump on the train and help people like helping people is never going to go out of style and it's not something that will ever end until all humans are gone like we all need help in some way shape or form whether it's uh, money or just somebody to talk to sometimes we all end up needing some sort of human help kenny yeah, um, again, piggybacking off of what Luke was just saying, I think uh, everything that he just spoke about that the Central Oregon Peacekeepers actually uh, does work in, it just boils down to common human decency. And that's something that I find is severely lacking in, um, the, in our country's makeup right now. 
uh, whether it's a lack of empathy, whether it's lack of just decency, whether it's a uh, lack of understanding, uh, whether it's lack of communication, there is there are those key components that usually uh, come with just being a really good human being just seem to have, and I it, it, it's kind of blatant. It I mean it was getting to that point. Uh, for a while, but the last four years, uh, really, that really got thrown out the window. It all turned into uh, uh, all about self, all about, you know, me, how can I look out for number one and no one else? So doing uh, mutual aid work, doing um, any form of community outreach, you have to have those levels of human decency, uh, you know, running through your veins and, you know, going out and doing this without trying to pat yourself on the back, without trying to, you know, just make it all about yourself. Uh, that is a key component to it as well. And something that, uh, something else that is re that really bothers me right now is when we hear from, uh, or whenever, uh, all of these different uh, group leaders will approach uh, city, county, state, federal government for uh, with concrete plans. Like uh, I, I wouldn't say 100% uh, foolproof, but plans that you could actually work with. And you present them saying, "Hey, look, this is the issue. This is the fix that we've spent our time. We've done the labor for you. We just need to implement it." And we're not even looking for credit. We just want to get this done because there are people that are hurting right now. There are people that are needing our help there that you have the ability to do. We've done the work for you. And they're like, oh yeah, totally. We'll go ahead and do it. And then when it comes time to uh, put your money where your mouth is, they don't. And that is a problem. And that is, again, part of the old status quo. You get a lot of lip service, you get a lot of placating, you get a lot of, oh, that's a great idea, but it might be a little too controversial. You know what? We have to get to the point where it's okay to be uncomfortable. It's okay to break the systems that we're so used to. And yeah, you know what? There, you're going to have a segment of people that get mad at you for actually going and going and helping these people. But here's the thing. The people that are in all these communities that are coming up with these ideas, we've dealt with this all of our lives. The fact that you're having to deal with this for maybe, oh, I don't know, a month or two that you have people that are pressing you, sending you emails, uh, coming to city council meetings, going to all these different things and actually bringing it up. And whenever there's a Q&A and you speak truth to power, and all they do is just sit there and they're like, okay, next caller. And they ignore it. That says, okay, yeah, you know what? We actually don't care. That has to change. So there are people like on this panel, there are people that support all of these other groups that are doing the work that uh, the boots on the ground that are actually going out and talking to the people in the houseless community that are going out whenever there is a kid that's being bullied uh, in a racial setting at a school people that are actually going out and taking the steps to actually make the change, we're used to the uncomfortability. So we just, we need people to make sure that they rally behind us and actually start getting in on it and doing the work as well, because we can't constantly carry this on our backs uh, on our own. You have to actually join in. And if you actually say that you care and you start throwing up little hashtags and all these great things and you know, sharing an article, that's great. But if you're not doing the work, that's not gonna get us anywhere. You actually have to do put the work in. Great. I'm gonna to go to I wanna bring in Jake here and then I'm gonna throw out a question for you all, all you folks. Jake, I'm wondering what's what's the um, toughest part about being an organizer? Um, and I'm wondering like and uh, what's the most rewarding part? Yeah, no, thank you so much. I also just wanna uh, shout out to Kenny, Maria, and Luke. That all of that resonates a lot. Um, but yeah, I think the biggest challenge for me is I'm, I'm fairly new to organizing starting in the last uh, year or so. And so, especially in the time of the pandemic, it's really hard to make those human connections. Um, and it's really easy to feel isolated and stuck. And I think, especially in this world of organizing, there's a, a feeling of wanting to get it right. I think that the people that you work with and the people you're trying to help, you know, are impacted by this work and are impacted by the things you're trying to engage in. And so that can feel like an immense amount of pressure 
um, especially for people who are just getting started in this. Um, and so that's why I'm so appreciative for events like this because it provides a nice ramp to get people engaged in a way that um, is accessible. And so I think that that's my number one advice for people doing this is being transparent about the challenges we face, acknowledging that none of this is normal and that all of this is hard. And I think when doing that, it alleviates a lot of shame that you can feel or a lot of insecurity. And I think we'll find that we build stronger relationships and community when we do that. Um, and I think that ties very closely into the most rewarding part of this work is, is getting to see people and getting to find and unveil ways that we're connected that we may not have known. Um, and then through that, you know, we're not just finding ways in which we're connected to each other, but ways in which we can connect to overturn systems of oppression. Um, what becomes possible when I link arms with uh, brothers and sisters and non-binary folks of other movements as well. Um, I think we're finding that these multifaceted issues require multifaceted solutions. And so it's just inc always amazing to me uh, the ways in which you get on a phone call and you talk with someone for a little bit and you're like, oh, you, you know this person and you have this resource and I know this person and what if we just brought this together? And there's nothing more rewarding than uh, finding those connections through the work, so. Maria. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think for when I was a new organizer, um, the one of the hardest things for me was to wake up. So I started out as a Black Lives Matter activist and I was inspired um, to work for police accountability. And um, it, as, as a lot of folks know, Black Lives Matter is a broad movement for, uh, for Black liberation. And it involves a lot of different areas that we could work in, the medical industry, uh, education. There's all sorts of inequities, right? And, and, um, and I wanted to be in this corner of police accountability. And um, so, so part, I, I think like facing, facing my, own, um, my own biases, and, um, not, not only around race, but around sex and gender and able, able ability, you know, ableism. Um, I found that I was incredibly ableist um, or, or that I was, I don't wanna like, I don't think I need to label myself, but we can say that the things that we, we do often perpetuate a particular oppression realm. So I was perpetuating a lot of ableism and, and, and sort of retraining my brain to, to think of a future that doesn't, doesn't involve the language and culture of oppression was one of the hardest things. But as I got more and more into it, um, you know, what Jake spoke about, like the, the difficulty with feeling guilt and shame, maybe that we're not doing enough. Um, I just wanna share that if you're doing things and you're doing your best and you're doing the things that um, you feel really passionate about, like I realized that my passion was really around police accountability. And I found BIPOC leaders who shared that, that, that passion. Um, if, you're, if you're able to, to find your place and do that work in, in ways that um, are led by the most impacted people, then I would say you, you're doing your part and none of us can do it all. And a lot of us need to get to work, but that's on, that's not on you, right? That's like, you know, if other people don't do the work, I can't force them to do the work, but I can be contented with the level of work that I am able to do. And this work requires a lot of downtime, a lot of self-care and a lot of rest. And that is also doing. So this is a theme I, I wanna hit on. Um, so we all bring different skills to advance all of our missions. Like I'm always impressed by the people who are able to just easily talk with lawmakers, like the, the people who are gonna thrive in the meetings that y'all are doing. Um, you know, the, in the phone banking, like a lot of the stuff gives me person, like personally anxiety. But you know, I'll bring my photography skills, my design skills, my writing skills to it. I'm wondering, uh, this is for everybody, like how, how can people, um, I guess, what, what are you bringing in the, the specialty towards your work? And how, how can you um, give advice to people who wanted, who might not feel like they have the personality type or, or specific skills to be activists? I don't mind starting with that one. 
Um, well, for me, uh, my writing has also, like I said earlier, my writing has turned into public speaking as well um, and engaging with uh, local leaders um, uh, and leader, uh, whether they're from uh, the BIPOC community or with uh, city government or county government. Um, but I, I think f for me, my uh, the, the speaking aspect of it comes from a long line of essentially improv. Um, uh, you know, I did a lot of improv uh, when I was younger and I, you know, I've run podcasts, webcasts, things like that. And it's uh, my first podcast was by myself for an hour and a half with no guests, no breaks. And I just spoke for an hour, for an hour and a half just to try to come up with different topics and still be engaging. So now that, and using those skills over the years has brought me to this point now to where I don't have a problem uh, speaking to anyone. If someone says, hey, Kenny, here's Mike, speak on this topic, I will be able to go for a while. But when it comes to other people though, when it comes to finding your strength, finding uh, what you can do, I think my best advice is figure out what you love. And if you have an interest in this work, whether it's social justice, whether it's uh, DEI, find out what you love and then figure out a way to incorporate that in. It's, a, it's almost like one of those things where, it's, where people say, you know, if you do what you love, you'll never work a day in your life. Well, I love being able to talk to people about this type of work because my ultimate goal is I want everyone to feel safe. I want people to be able to get home safe. You know, I've been pulled over uh, several times. Um, there was the most recent time that I was pulled over. Uh, I had there was I have I had a dirty license plate. One patrol officer pulled me and my daughter over, and after they saw me, and saw and saw that I was black. Next thing you know, I have uh, three additional squad cars behind me, and it terrified me. So you, ha I want people to be able to not have to have that same feeling. So I try my best if someone says, you know, what can I do? How can I help? Well, the first thing is, you know, all right, well, if you're trying to help, A, that's step number one. But B, find out what you love, find your strengths, whether it, you know, if you're an IT guy, I'm an, uh, you know, or an IT person, I, I do IT. So I know about running streams. I know about, uh, you know, configuring cameras or setting up applications or, run, or, you know, running things on the web, stuff like that. That's my forte. But I also know that, again, public speaking, things like that as well. Um, if, you're, if your specialty is, like say you're former military and you, you, know, you know about the discipline and chain of command and things like that, you, you may not be uh, someone that has their boots on the ground, but you may also be really good at logistics and helping organize, helping plan, helping come up with uh, strategic uh, ways to progress the work to the eventual goal. So my advice is to just find your find what you love to do and figure out a way to incorporate that. And, and if you don't know how to incorporate it, ask questions because there are a ton of people in this work that will be able to say, hey, all right, well, if you want to help, you can go do this. I mean, there's always room for help. We always need help. You're muted, Doug. It's one day, a couple of years, I'll figure out the mute button and I'm going to be on top of it. Um, Luke, I'm, I'm wondering um, how you appreciate, like um, you're making new connections as part of the Central Oregon Peacekeepers. Um, what do you appreciate from people who are, um, you know, you start to work with? Like how do you, the attitudes, the skills, like how do you, what do you appreciate about people you, you meet and who you're now working with? Yeah, I mean, every every human has something like everybody's got that one little thing that just makes them go absolutely bananas with uh, just happiness and joy so if there if there's something that i know that somebody is good at i want to push them to go and do that thing uh that's why i feel my team is successful i they each have their thing that they really enjoy doing and i'm not going to get in between them and doing what they like doing uh there's it's something that's going to end up helping and it's something that if I know a way that it can be used to further the movement, I'm going to let them know, hey, that's a really interesting skill. If you throw this over here and do pretty much the exact same thing, you're going to end up being just a powerhouse in what you're wanting to do. Uh, so like uh, with Kenny, since we're in the same area, 
uh, whenever we hold events and he's able to get out to them, I'm usually telling him, hey, I don't have to speak now that you're here. I'm not the one that people have to listen to because I don't mind public speaking, but it's not really my thing. I'm a big person. I like getting in the way of things. I don't get scared by things easily. So I'm usually the one uh, that's at the forefront of basically putting myself between a cop and somebody that they're trying to harass or putting myself between a protester and a counter protester. Cause that's just, if you, if you really want to try and get through me, you're, you're going to have a hell of a time doing that. Uh, so really if the more that I can just celebrate people and the more that they basically just say, Hey, I'm good at this one thing. How can I be helpful? I will always answer that question and tell you, go, go do this. You don't have, you don't even have to be a part of the peacekeepers. Just go do that. If you think that that's what you, what your morals are telling you to do, just go do it. Be that good person. Nothing is stopping anybody from being that good person really besides themselves. One day, one day I'll get the mute button, right? Um, Luke, fo Luke, following up on that, um, so you, this has been quite a year. What's the one thing that would have been most surprising uh, if you could talk to your um, yourself from one year ago, what's the one thing that would be most surprising to yourself one year ago that you did this past year? Ooh, um, I would probably have to say, on honestly, this this just this moment being in a panel sponsored by the ACLU. There's a year ago, I thought, okay, I'm just gonna stand in the way of people, and then. By the time all the protesting is done, I'm just going to be done, I guess, and we're just going to go back to normal. And just as it kept going along, as the days went along, it was just so obvious that that's not, it's not the end. There, the end may not, not even come during my, my lifetime or anybody's lifetime on this call. Uh, so just, just the fact that from like exactly a year ago, I was sitting here mad that the NBA was canceled and that I didn't get to watch college basketball. And now I'm here discussing social activism with a bunch of people doing incredible things. And that's something I never would have thought I'd be doing, even as a kid. As a kid, I just wanted to be left alone. Uh, so I'm, I'm really just honored that I'm allowed to just do this work because I know as a community leader, I have, I'm speaking for a lot of people when I do speak publicly. And the fact that I'm given the space to do so is just a complete honor. Thank you, Luke. Um, Jake, I wanna go back to you. Um, so the pandemic has changed a lot of things about how organizing has worked. Um, I'm wondering what's something that from the pandemic era that will last through um, when, when everything is uh, fine again, when people can interact in person again, what, have, what, have, what lessons from the pandemic era will you maintain? Oh, there's so many. Um, but I think on the day to day, you know, just the accessibility and reach, um, both in terms of like issues and uh, really exciting goals and ways that we can implement technology um, has been at the forefront of what we do. You know, if we can lead a room into community over Zoom and ask those questions, then we sure as hell can do it <laughs> in person too. And I think it calls to question, you know, what makes human connection, what makes this work important and to be able to feel one another. Um, and I just also want to name too that the accessibility thing that we have the ability now to, to out do outreach. Washington County is huge and I wouldn't be able to connect with many of the people that I have had it not been, Zoom not been the norm. Um, and so I think just continuing to build in those spaces and practices for um, continuing making our work as accessible as possible. Um, and with that, I'm going to do a short little plug that in doing so, uh, we're able to, like Emerge is able to host advocacy nights over Zoom and get people from all over Oregon in the same room uh, once a month. And that's gonna take place every second Monday. Um, we're hosting advocacy nights for people to learn how to use their voice and how to use uh, their power in their communities in order to push through legislation that makes Oregon a safer place for everyone. And so if you are interested in joining those advocacy nights with Emerge, feel free to email myself at jake at togetherlab.org or info at emerge.org. Um, and we would be happy to connect with you 
into this larger community. Can we get those uh, in the chat somewhere? If somebody could fill that up, that'd be great. Um, I want to I want to throw that question. Oh, Maria. Oh, I was just going to say, yeah, the, the whole online thing has been a, a boon to Pacific Northwest Family Circle. Our organization has families in four states, and we hold a monthly meeting um, for families and supporters to to figure out how to move the organization forward and how to how we want to work together on the justice struggle. And before the pandemic, we were really struggling with access to technology and people understanding how to use Zoom. Um, access is still an issue. There are a lot of folks who live in public housing or other places where internet service is extremely poor. And so I think moving forward, we are gonna be doing hybrid, um, hybrid, hybrid events and meetings. And I think that's just gonna, um, it's just gonna make uh, all of the things that we do more effective. So, Kenny, I want to ask you as a, as a technology person um, with way more knowledge about that stuff than, than me, um, how is technology going to be used? And also, I think maybe Jake, you'd be answer this question too. Like, what's the future of technology in, in social justice organizing? This right here. This is your future. This is what keeps you protected. This is what keeps you, this is what holds them accountable. This is what uncovers the things that are usually just said in the quiet, this helps them get said out loud. That's what, the, in my opinion, this is one of the most important tools that is, uh, that is available to social justice workers, whether it's use of communication from group to group. I mean, I could run this, uh, I, I could be in this Zoom meeting from my phone if I wanted to instead of my laptop. Um, I was in a meeting yesterday uh, that was a quick uh, meeting that was set up uh, with uh, the, the NAACP um, while I was driving into the office from my phone. Uh, we have seen uh, the, the verdict from the Derek Chauvin case would have been completely different in my opinion had not there been phones streaming and recording that entire incident. And it's happening more and more. Will Smith is credited with saying uh, racism uh, isn't getting worse, it's just being filmed. And it, it is, it's absolutely true. But on the flip side, accountability is now the cause of things being filmed. So, or it is, uh, the, is a direct um, experience from things being filmed. I think on top of that though, uh, something piggybacking off of what, what Maria said, is accessibility is a big thing. There are a lot of issues uh, in, uh, you know, uh, lower income neighborhoods uh, where people don't have access to high speed internet. They don't have access to just internet in general. Uh, infrastructure in this country uh, needs a massive overhauling. We have these uh, fat cats and billionaires uh, that literally could overhaul the infrastructure of this country to provide this uh, out without their, without being uh, shady. You know, I mean, I know that there's uh, some drones that are uh, currently being set up to be able to provide Wi-Fi around, but there are, uh, we have the ability to do it and we just need people to take a step forward. I, uh, when I lived in Georgia, I worked uh, with a group that was working to create uh, hot spots that were, were able to just be plugged right into the ground and they were they just piggybacked signals uh, so that they could spread signals when uh, the ISPs, the internet service providers, wouldn't go and actually dig up the ground and replace the wiring. They're like, all right, we're just going to go ahead and do it because people need to be able to have access to this. Because not only does it help with activism, but it also helps with education. We have so much information that we can pull from a phone, from a laptop, if we have that internet connection. If we don't have it, then you just have a piece of technology that's kind of cool. So I think that right now, you, the utilization of these technologies, especially again, uh, I go back to the phone, these smartphones, because you have a tiny computer right in your pocket. And yeah, people may use it just to look at memes, okay? Let's do better, let's do more. Let's actually use these tools to actually spread these messages and actually go and get people connected and bring people together. So uh, yeah, phones, that's gonna, that's gonna be the big fear for me. Perfect, well, we have a few minutes left. I wanna make sure everybody has the opportunity to um, 
um, say all the ways people can engage with you. I know we've uh, brought it up a number of times throughout this past hour, but I want to make sure everybody everybody watching has uh, uh, there's no no confusion on that. So I would like love for Maria for you to start. Um, if there's anything left you say about a minute minute each, if if that's possible, I just want to be able to have uh, make sure everybody can get connected with you all. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I, I went through my checklist um, during my introduction, and so I won't take a minute. I'll just say, um, you know, you, ha you had a question of like how people can use their skills, and they, people think they don't have the personality or the skills. Um, everyone has the personality and skills to advocate for things they believe in and to support, um, support other people in, in their success around justice, social justice issues. And, you know, um, I know some amazing introverts who are great at analysis and fundraising. Um, not everyone has to show up at a protest. Uh, not everyone has to speak in public. And in fact, not everyone should speak in public. So um, if you are interested in working directly with, the, with families who've lost loved ones to police violence or, um, um, working for them on their ideas, please email me at pnwfamilycircle at gmail.com and let me know that you heard about us from the ACLU and we will find um, your favorite thing to do and put you to work for the families. Thank you so much. Okay, Luke, I wanna, I wanna go back to you. Um, we've mentioned it several times, so how can people connect with, with you in, in the Central Oregon Peacekeepers? Yeah. Uh, the Peacekeepers main platform, I would say, is uh, Facebook. It's just Central Oregon Peacekeepers. Uh, when you go on Facebook, uh, that's usually where uh, you'll see a lot of our posts. Uh, we also have a website, just centralorganpeacekeepers.com. Uh, really, any social media site, aside from some of the uh, weird off-brand ones that have come out recently, uh, just Central Oregon Peacekeepers. Uh, also, just centralorganpeacekeepers at gmail.com. Uh, really, if you have any questions at all, just sending us a message through any of those forums and uh, we'll be more than happy to respond. And if you're interested in joining, we'll definitely see what we can do to get you. Jake, I, I, three times on the mute button this hour, it's a record. Um, Jake, how about you? How, what are the, how can people um, connect with your work and, and help advance what you're advancing? Definitely. Uh, we have the Emerge Advocacy Nights, as I said before, if you're interested in those, please email us at info at emerge.org. The other thing I forgot to mention is just for the month of May, we're also looking at the intersections of faith communities and people of fierce love, housing justice, and climate justice, and really how we can push forward with all three of those in a short little sprint of advocacy just for the month of May. And those are happening on two Tuesdays this May. And so if that's something that interests you then uh, to also email merge at info at emerge.org. And as we close out, I just wanna say that in community organizing and advocacy that if you think you're not qualified, that you are a part of the community and that you are immediately qualified just by being a part of that. And so your voice is vitally important. It's equally important as well as to anyone else's um, because no one can take away your lived experience, so. Perfect. And Kenny, how about any, any final plugs? We got about 30 seconds. Um, uh, only, uh, I mean, I do have my website, oddzuki.com, O-D-D-Z-U-K-I.com. Um, and I, pretty much anything that I write uh, usually starts out on Facebook and then it gets transcribed over to there. Um, and uh, you can email me at uh, adzuki at gmail.com as well. Uh, really, I am currently working on building a network here in the Pacific Northwest uh, to be able to share ideas, resources with all of the different organizations because there's a lot of cross-pollination within this state of people transplanting to different areas, but they don't always know where to go. And I wanna make sure that people are safe. So I'm working on creating a network. I'll probably be releasing some of that on the website as well. I may even pitch it over to the peacekeepers as well to see whether or not we can kind of get that spread a little bit because their reach is way bigger than mine. <laughs> Perfect. Um, well, with that, it's just about three o'clock. I want to thank you all the panelists here. Um, Y'all were fantastic. Um, I hope, hopefully it was as entertaining and informative for other folks watching. Um, next up for the people watching is uh, legislator meetings. That information should be in your email. Um, 
And again, the email address if you have any questions is development at aclu-or.org. Uh, that you should be able to get an answer to any questions on in there. Um, again, thank you. Um, yeah, the Zoom link should be the Zoom link should be in your calendar invite in your email. Um, any questions, email address is right there. Thank you all for for joining us, and thank you all for your work here. Thanks for having us.